Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Rula Deeb. I'm a senior principal at Geosynta Consultants in Oakland, California, and the coordinator of the webinar series on behalf of Startup and ESCCP. I have the pleasure of facilitating today's event. This webinar focuses on DOD-funded research efforts to develop absorptive technologies for PFAS removal. First, Dr. Kurt Pennell from Brown University will talk about the development of a polymer-stabilized powder-activated carbon and a polymer-stabilized ion exchange resin for use as injectable particulate amendments for PFAS absorption in situ. Second, Mr. Matt Vanderkoy from Geosyntax Consultants and Dr. Ayn Pham from the University of Waterloo will talk about their research on in-situ PFAS immobilization using activated carbon barriers. Each of the two presentations will be followed by a brief Q&A session. And depending on the time, we will conclude the webinar with a longer Q&A session. The next two slides provide instructions on optimizing your webinar experience. If you have not done so already, please download Zoom at this link shown here and provide it to you in your webinar registration confirmation email. If you cannot download Zoom, you can view the slides using a compatible internet browser, such as Firefox, IE, or Edge, and by creating a free Zoom account. If you continue to have difficulties or if your screen freezes, try keying in Control and F5 to perform a hard refresh of your screen. You can also download a PDF of the slides from the webinar webpage and call into the conference line provided to you in your webinar registration confirmation email. Another way to view the webinar is to go to the CERTUP and ESCCP YouTube channel at the link shown here as we will be live streaming uh, the event. Please note that the broadcast today will be listen only. You can submit questions by using the Q&A box on your screen. You do not need to wait until the Q&A period to submit your questions. We do encourage you to get them in well in advance of the Q&A um, sessions. Uh, when you submit your questions, we please ask that you add your organization name at the end of your questions so that we can identify it during the Q&A session. Please reserve the Q&A box for uh, questions for the speaker and do not use the chat box as it is reserved for comments related to technical difficulties. With that, I would like to go ahead and introduce Cara Patton, who is an environmental project manager at Noblis and the deputy program manager for CERTUP and ESCCP's environmental restoration program area. Cara has worked with CERTUP and ESCCP since 2008, and before that, she worked at the Drug Enforcement Administration as a forensic chemist. Cara received her master's degree in chemistry from George Mason University. Cara, please proceed. Thank you, Rula. I'm happy to welcome everyone to today's CERTUP and ESTCP webinar. The next few slides will provide a quick overview of CERTUP and ESTCP. CERTIP and ESTCP are the Department of Defense's Investments in Environment and Installation Energy Science and Technology. The programs report to the Deputy Assistant Director of Defense for Energy Resilience and Optimization, headquartered at the Pentagon. CERTIP is the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program, established by Congress as a partnership between the DOD, the Department of Energy, and the EPA. CERTIP addresses high priority environmental science and technology opportunities that focus on the top priority DOD requirements. CERTIP funds both fundamental research as well as advanced technology development that ultimately impact real world environmental management. ESTCP is the Environmental Security Technology Certification Program in which we demonstrate and validate innovative environmental and installation energy technologies. These investments capitalize on past investments under CERTUP or other research programs and are designed to transition technologies out of the lab and into the field. 
Especially important in all ESTCP demonstrations is the ultimate transition to implementation and regulatory acceptance. Advances in science and technology provide the DOD with the tools needed to effectively manage and restore its assets to protect troops, their families, the public, and the environment. CERTIP and ESTCP investments improve installation energy resilience, environmental cleanup, UXO remediation, resource conservation, and the sustainment and maintenance of defense assets. CERTIP and ESTCP fund, monitor, and actively guide relevant and applied research, development, testing, and evaluation projects for the DOD's top environment and installation energy challenges. Our programs currently fund over 600 active projects. To maximize research impact, CERTIP and ESTCP collaborate with top talent across sectors. In 2023, we funded projects with 77 academic institutions, 91 federal performers, and 52 industry partners. Our innovation and technology development inform DOD policy to ultimately improve environmental and energy management. Next slide. CERTIP and ESTCP are funding a broad range of PFAS-related projects. You can access an overview of our PFAS program as well as project descriptions on our website. The boxes along the top of the graph illustrate workshops that have been held to develop a strategic plan for addressing PFAS issues. A summary report was prepared for each workshop to summarize the discussions and to identify research, demonstration, and technology transfer needs. To view workshop reports, click the associated boxes at the top. Each sort of project has an associated box with a project title which links to a full description of the project as well as any reports that have been published as part of the project. Each ESTCP topic listed represents a single topic. Click the project title to go to the project webpage. Our webinar series highlights outstanding projects across all of our main focus areas. The next webinar ER topic is on April 4th on the novel PFAS treatment technologies. Registration is open for webinars through the end of this year. You can find additional information about upcoming webinars at this link shown on this slide. All past webinars are archived and can be accessed using this link. I would like to remind you that a copy of the presentation of today's session can be downloaded from our webinar page, web page. We would appreciate it if you can please take a moment to complete the survey that will pop up on your screen at the end of the webcast. At this point, I will turn it back over to Rula to introduce today's speaker. Thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoy the webinar. Thank you so much, Cara. It is now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker for today, Dr. Kurt Pinnell who is a professor in the School of Engineering at Brown University. Before that, Kurt was chair of the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Tufts University, and also the Bernard Gordon Senior Faculty Fellow in Environmental Engineering. He served as a professor in Civil and Environmental Engineering at the Georgia Institute of Technology and held an adjunct faculty appointment in the Department of Neurology at the Emory University School of Medicine. Kurt's current research focuses on PFAS treatment, environmental exposures, and the use of engineered nanomaterials for subsurface characterization. He is widely published. Uh, in fact, he has published over 200 journal articles and book chapters and has received numerous uh, research and teaching awards including the third project of the year award in environmental restoration twice in fact in 2006 and 2012. He's also the recipient of a national institute of health career award and the order of omega faculty member of the year award. Kurt uh, got his bachelor's degree from the university of maine his master's degree from north carolina state university and his doctoral degree from the University of Florida. Kurt, we're delighted to have you. Please get us started. Thank you, Rula. So today I'm gonna to be talking about a work on development of injectable amendments for in-situ treatment of PFAS impacted groundwater. 
<clears throat> so just a little bit of background on our present on my presentation. Um, I'm first going to present what a permeable adsorptive barrier is, um, and then show you some of the stabilized particulate amendments we've developed. And then I'll share some of the results of our work uh, about how the particles are delivered in porous media, how they sequester PFAS, and then some mathematical modeling and an example field trial that we recently completed. So this slide, the idea here is to show you what a permeable adsorptive barrier would look like in the field. On the left-hand side, we have our plume, and we have some upgraded monitoring wells, and groundwater is flowing from left to right. In the middle of the box here, we have where we would inject the amendment and form a treatment zone. And then down gradient, we might have some monitoring wells where we'd monitor for PFAS, and we'd hope that these would be clean. Um, in this uh, treatment zone, some of the key issues are we don't want to um, reduce the permeability. We want to maintain flow through this zone. So it's very important when you inject uh, particulate amendments that you don't clog the pores or reduce permeability so that you would get basically flow bypassing around the treatment zone. So if you had flow bypassing, you may uh, it may appear that you've treated the plume because there's no, nothing coming down gradient but really the contaminants is moving around the plume. So it's very important to be careful about the permeability effects that your injection might have on the system. Um, these types of systems are not designed to destroy the contaminant. They're really uh, absorbing it. We're trying to concentrate the contaminant and sequester it in this zone. Um, and so these the applications for this type of a system may be in a narrow source zone where you're trying to, uh, if the source zone is up, up here to the left, you would try to control the migration off that source zone. Or further down in the plume, if you had a pump and treat type system that you've been operating for many, many years, and you wanna to go to an in situ type treatment where you don't have to extract the water, you could inject this type of a zone or a barrier uh, to capture the plume. In shallow systems, um, what I show here is for a deeper system where you do inject the, the amendment. In shallow systems, you could apply a funnel and gate system um, and that would allow for easy, easier change out of the, of the sorbent. Here are just some examples of commercially available particulate amendments. Um, and when we started working on this, one of the issues was we, we found that most of the formulations are proprietary. So we couldn't really know what kind of a stabilizing agent or, or even the properties of the carbon were in the system unless we reverse engineered it, uh, which we weren't allowed to do. Uh, and so we started working with our own materials using um, readily available materials. Uh, also, there's not a lot of independent data out at the time that we started on, on absorption um, and delivery of these uh, materials. And also, we were interested in, in the long-term performance. So how do these perform uh, over the long term and what type of factors will influence that performance? So that was what motivated us when we first started working on this type of uh, materials. Here I show you a stabilized powder activated carbon. We call this SPAC. Um, this is just um, commercially two commercially available products. We have polydimac here, which is a coagulant, a polymer, um, and Darko 100 um, activated carbon. And what we did with these two materials, we basically grind the, the Darko 100 mesh um, and then mix it with the polydadmac. And we can do this at different ratios. Um, we initially ha had quite a bit of polydadmac, but we found that we didn't need as much. So we've reduced the amount of polydadmac and increased the amount of activated carbon. But what I wanna show you in the lower left is immediately after mixing, if you just had the pack and you mixed it up, it would look uh, black. And so would the solution with polydadmac. But after 48 hours, you can see that the, the solution or suspension that contains only the pack has settled out. And then the one that contains the polydadmac or the polymer will stay stable for a very long time. Um, and so the, the idea here is that the polydadmac stabilizes the powder activated carbon and also will facilitate delivery in the subsurface. The second material working with is a stabilized ion exchange resin. Um, here we're just using Amberlite IRA 910. Um, we've it, we've it, uh, explored the 
um, these another number of different amberlite materials and also some other ion exchange resins. Um, but this is just one example that's been used in the literature. We mix this with a um, non-anic copolymer, um, pyronic, has a molecular weight about 12,000 milligrams per liter. When we mix these together, grind, we grind the, up the resin, we mix it with the pyronic, and then we form this stabilized suspension. It looks a little bit like a milky suspension. Um, <clears throat> and the idea for working with the resins was we, we were um, interested in having a material that worked well with shorter chain PFAS and also offered the potential for regeneration, in situ regeneration, where we could flush uh, the treated treatment zone um, to regenerate the, the resin. So here I show you just some injection of the SPAC injection into, uh, this is just uh, clean Ottawa sand. It's easier to see with a Ottawa sand, but on the left-hand side, we have the column packed, it's water saturated. Um, in this case, we're flowing in upflow mode. Um, and you can see here in the middle picture, this is after 3.5 core volumes um, of injection. You can see the material going up. It's relatively uniform front, but you see some uh, flow on the side. Um, and then after we've put in about three and a half core volumes and we've flushed with some water, um, this is the re resulting uh, situation here. And we have about, and this it's a relatively small column, we have about 25 grams of the pack retained. We don't see a permeability reduction, which is what we're hoping for. Um, we just see very minor permeability reductions, usually less than 10%. Um, and again, um, you, you want to avoid any permeability reduction where you cause bypassing in the field. This is uh, some uh, scanning electron microscope images of the sand after it's been treated, before and after it's been treated with the ion exchange resin. And on the left-hand side is a clean sand. Um, and we do um, we do uh, EDS on this so we can actually uh, look at the, the atoms that are on, those, on the surface here. So the red box is where we do the EDS, the spectroscopy. Um, and on the right, this picture shows you um, the ion exchange, the ion exchange resin attached to the Ottawa sand. And you can see all these little bumps here, little particles in the surface. But the value of the EDS is to you actually scan in this region, and we can see the carbon content increases dramatically. So we know that this is the actually the the resin attaching, not just some anomaly or, or was there um, before. So this is an interesting way or a nice way to show that the resin is actually uh, coating the surface. Um, and we can confirm that it's actually the resin. This slide shows you a comparison of uh, the SPAC and, and SIXR resin retention within the column. One thing to note in this, uh, for this system that we used, we've got for the resin on the left-hand side, we get relatively uniform um, attachment. So the particles attach and, and coat the surface and then they reach a sort of a maximum value. Um, and then they transport, the rest transports through the column. On the right-hand side is the SPAC retention profile. We see a little bit more of an exponential decay. Um, and this can be due to a number of factors where we, you could have straining or you could have larger particles being attached near the inlet. So if you don't have a uniform distribution of uh, particles, uh, a single distribution of particles, you can have some of the larger particles being attached at, near the inlet. Um, so this is the type of behavior that we then model and try to simulate um, so we can predict what will happen in the field. And I'll show you some, show you some of those slides later. So, but one of the take home messages from this was that in, in this case, the resin retention was more uniform and slightly higher than that of the, the activated carbon. This slide shows you a comparison of adsorption on these materials. Um, on the left-hand side, I show you the ground powder activated carbon. On the right, I show you the ground ion exchange resin. Um, one of the things that was interesting here for the, um, we see pretty similar PFOS adsorption on these two materials, similar magnitudes, pretty, pretty good adsorption. So our um, values are pretty high in terms of the mass per gram of material. Um, one thing that we found was that grinding the 
carbon actually increased the adsorption by about a factor of three. We didn't see much of an effect with the resin. So the resin basically stayed the same whether we ground it or not. Uh, the powder activated carbon actually increased um, absorption. So we think this is because we opened up some more surface area um, <clears throat> and more accessible to the pores in the system. But it's important to measure the um, adsorption of the material, the PFAS on the material you're going to actually inject into the subsurface, um, not on the starting material. This is a, another SEM image. What I wanted to show you here was some of the just adsorptions where we have, um, this is the ground resin on the left. You can see, so you see a picture of what the surface looks like. And then on the right, this is the EDS after it's been exposed to, to PFOS and you can see all the fluorine shows up. So it's kind of an interesting way to show uh, the fluorine. And this is on the same uh, scan area. So you can see the, it sort of matches on both sides where you see all the fluorine um, from the adsorption um, that occurs. So it shows you direct evidence of PFAS adsorption onto this material. Okay, here I'm going to show you a breakthrough curve for a SPAC column. So this is just PFAS alone. Um, and what this is, is basically we pack a column, <clears throat> we put in the, um, we, we flush it with the SPAC like I showed you before. And then we chase it. So we put in a pulse of the SPAC. And then we inject a PFOS solution. Um, and so as we go from left to right here, this is number of pore volumes that we've injected after we've done the treatment with the SPAC. Um, relative concentration is plotted in the y axis. So here we're injecting at the beginning 100 micrograms. Um, per liter of PFOS. So 100 parts per billion of PFOS into the column that's been treated with polydidmac and PAC. And what you can see after about <clears throat> 15, 24 volumes, we're not seeing anything come out. Um, and so what we did was we increased to 20 milligrams per liter of PFOS. So we could, we wanted to see breakthrough. Um, and so we increased it at about 17 pore volumes. To 20 milligrams per liter, which is really high, but we wanted to saturate the system and see when breakthrough occurred. And you can see that after about 40 pore volumes, total pore volumes, we see breakthrough of the PFOS. And these numbers up here are the basically the area under this curve of what which we retained. So we have uh, about 35 micrograms here because we weren't really applying very much. And then we have 10 milligrams over here because we were injecting quite a bit. Uh, so we want, again, we wanted to see breakthrough. So that's why we increased the concentration in the system. Um, so if we just had extended this, you know, that 100 milligram per liter PFOS injection for a long period of time, we, you can estimate that the capacity would have been reached after about 66,000 pore volumes. Okay, so we would have had to run this for about 6,000 pore volumes to see breakthrough based on um, these numbers we have here. This next slide shows you a, a, a picture of or a graph of PFOS breakthrough in a resin treated column. Um, and so this one is, we have a relative concentration and then pore volumes we injected. And we inject, we started with 100 micrograms per liter PFOS as we did before. And then we increased to 100 milligrams per liter of PFOS. So we increased even more. Uh, because we expected pretty high retention in the system. Um, and then after about 60 pore volumes, we see breakthrough. Um, and again, this mass here is the area beneath the line if we had, if we had reached one. So that's how much mass was retained by the resin in the system. Now, if we do the similar type calculation that we did before, where we inject 100 micrograms per liter, um, this capacity would be reached after uh, 50,000 pore volumes. So almost an order of magnitude higher than the, the SPAC. And the, really the reason for this was, you saw that the absorption capacities were similar. You can see that there's a lot more resin retained in this column. So almost two to three times more resin was retained um, in the column, which I showed you in that retention profile. So it's very important to know how much resin or particular men are being retained in your column in order to do these calculations. 
All right. <clears throat> this is some mathematical modeling that we've done of the, these systems. Um, and this K is, an, it, we found that it was slightly rate limited. So this K represents a rate expression. Um, and again, this is for the resin column. Um, and we did, I didn't show you the data, but we did both PFOS and PFO breakthrough. Um, and this is our uh, Freundlich isotherm parameters for the soil with the, with the resin on it. Okay, so this, um, this is what the absorption should be with the resin in the system. Um, so these were derived from the batch experiments, so independently derived. Um, and we see slightly rate limited, uh, but we can fit this with a linear driving force expression and get pretty good uh, fits to the data that we, we obtain in the experiments. I want to show you uh, a study that we did in an aquifer cell. So this is, we did a treatability test in, a, um, in an aquifer cell in the lab. Um, and this was a push-pull test because we didn't, we uh, basically what that means is we're going to inject the carbon and then we're going to pull back out uh, from the same location. And that's what was done in the field. So that's why we were trying to simulate that. So this red uh, port here with the red cap on it is where we injected the carbon. And this is the material from the site. Um, and this is fully saturated, uh, this cell. There's a confining hair layer here that we, we put in with uh, with a fine sand, basically. But this is the aquifer material from the site we injected here, and then we pulled back on that. So initially, the, the whole area was contaminated with um, PFAS groundwater that we, we prepared so it mimicked the site. So in this graph in the lower right, um, what I show you, the blue is what was at the field site. So the blue, line, the blue bars are the field site. And then the oranges bars are the what we prepared. So we tried to prepare it close to what was in the field. It's not exact, but it just shows you this is the blue again is the field. The orange is what we prepared. And then after we pulled back on the system, um, these the post treatment um, are the values you can't really see because they're so small. So we saw a nine to nine nine percent removal of the PFAS, and these are the ones that were primarily um, of concern at the site. And you see. Of course, PFOS was quite high, and we saw almost complete removal of PFOS um, in this push-pull type test. Whoop, missed that slide. This is from the field site. It's a Navy site on the East Coast. Um, and this is the data from the push-pull test at the field site. Uh, what I want to show you on the right-hand side, um, this table, we have our pre-treatment -con pre concentrations here. Um, and note that these are in parts per billion. Whoops, sorry. These are in parts per billion and these are in parts per trillion. Um, and so the removal percent is calculated on the right-hand side. So we saw a dramatic removal um, of these contaminants. So this was a successful field test um, of some uh, powder activated carbon. We, in this case, we added 500 gallons of uh, Flexorb. So this was a commercially available uh, activated carbon and five grams per liter of polydadmac um, in over two intervals. And we added 250 gallons each at each look at each depth. I want to show you a little bit of the field scale modeling we're doing with uh, Linda Abriola. She's also at Brown University. Um, and we've done a lot of work on nanoparticle injection, and this is sort of an extension of that work to these particulate amendments. Um, so this is a radial uh, scenario, so radial injection. And so you have to, the flow is, the flow rate is going to decrease as you go away from the injection point. Um, so we, we tried to simulate sort of what was happening at our field site. Um, and these are um, just showing you the effect of retention capacity. So we have a maximum attachment or retention capacity of this material that we basically obtained from the column studies. Um, and then we apply this here. And what it, what it shows you is the amount of mass retained per gram of soil and the radius here. Um, and we're looking at if you had a higher S max, this is what the curve would look like, and a lower S max would look like this. So what we're trying to do is figure out ways to, um, we can have this type of um, 
injection, and we can also change parameters for our system and then understand how far we expect uh, the particulate amendments to go. They're basically the radius of influence from the point of injection. So that's the intent of this work. And, and in the future, we're going to compare this to field studies that are being done. But we're just getting the model going, and we're using the laboratory data now uh, that we get from our injection studies. So in conclusion, um, we found that both the injectable carbons and resins uh, can be stabilized, and we can, we can have subsurface injection. Uh, we don't see um, much reduction in permeability for these systems, which is good. Uh, we saw greater retention with the resins, which led to better performance. We saw in our pilot scale field demonstration, the effectiveness of the injectable carbon. And we've also, I showed you some of the work with our mathematical modeling. We can capture the breakthrough um, measured in columns, and we can predict what might happen in the field uh, for the injection. In terms of benefits for DOD, we are developing and validating a mathematical model to predict both the injection and absorption capacity. Um, we demonstrated the potential for the use of these particular amendments for in-situ treatment. And we've also identified factors to control the amendment performance, um, and these include rate-limited absorption, the retention behavior, and we've also looked at a, the effects of competitive absorption. What that means is we have a PFAS mixture, and I didn't show any of those data today, but in some of the papers that we have published, you can uh, see those results too. Just quick acknowledgments. Uh, the people I work with at Brow, I mentioned Linda Abriola does the modeling, and then a number of postdocs and graduate students are listed here. And on the right-hand side, I have some of my collaborators, um, both at universities and uh, Jim Hatton at Jacobs, and then uh, Michaela and Joe helped provide the activated carbons. Um, and some of the field work here was done with NSDE, and then Rula also uh, helps on some of our sort of projects. Here are some uh, uh, publications we've had. If you're interested, you can download these or you can reach out to me directly and I can provide you with these papers. Uh, one is on the ion exchange resin, and one is on the powder activated carbon. And with that, I'll stop and I'll take questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Kurt, for a very engaging presentation. And a reminder to our audience, please get your question in, uh, questions in using the Q&A box, not the chat box, as we're not uh, carefully monitoring that. Um, there's still time to go ahead and submit questions in that Q&A box, but we did receive a few that we'd like to relate to you, Kurt. Um, the first one is from um, Laredo Engineering Associates, um, and it goes as follows. Often for above grade, uh, above grade resin um, pump and treat application, pre treatment uh, may be necessary to prevent fouling. What are your thoughts about the potential for fouling uh, resulting in uh, reduced longevity for uh, subsurface applications? Yes, yeah, this is a really good question about the fouling. So um, there can be issues with uh, fouling, of, especially of resins. Um, one approach we're taking in, and we're studying this laboratory and hope to apply it in the field is we're, we're putting some activated carbon up gradient of the resin. So we're, we're using uh, what I would call a dual system where we have arranged in series where the activated carbon is uh, up gradient, it's cheaper um, and can remove uh, PFAS pretty well and some other organic matter and things like that. And then we have the resin down gradient. So that's one way we're trying to address this issue of um, how do we deal with other um, co-constituents or co-contaminants that are in the groundwater that might impact the performance of the resin. Thank you so much. Um, sorry, this next question is from um, Jose University in Japan. Can you please share some of the differences in regeneration performance between the powdered activated carbon and the ion exchange resin? Okay, so we haven't tried to uh, regenerate any of the powder activated carbon, um, but we, what, what we've done with the resin um, is we, in, we, after we treat the system or after we apply 
uh, after we inject it, then we apply the PFAS. Um, then we've injected solutions containing um, uh, basically uh, co-solvents and, and brine into the columns, and then um, measure the amount of the PFAS that comes back off. Um, we don't have any of those data published, so I can't share those with you um, right now, but we're working on a publication uh, to present some of the sort of what I call in situ regeneration. Uh, we're doing it in the laboratory in columns. But yeah, so we've tried that with the resin. We have not tried it with the carbon. Great. Um, this next question is from the Air Force. Um, did you or how do you plan to confirm that permeability uh, is not significantly reduced after um, injection? Using tracers, perhaps? <laughs> Good question. This is another good question. So in the column studies, we use uh, pressure transducers. Um, so we monitor uh, the basically the back pressure in the system uh, do, during the experiment, and we can basically quantify the permeability. In the aquifer cells, we do uh, tracer studies. Um, and so we run tracer studies, and we can uh, look at the front going through the, through the treated zone. So in that one, uh, image I showed you of the aquifer cell, we can monitor and see if there is bypassing of the tracer. Um, <clears throat> in the field, it's a, you know, of course, it's a more expensive or more complicated. Um, <clears throat> but one way to do it is look at the uh, head differences or pressure changes in the system. And also you could do a tracer study. But again, that's um, that, you know, that that's tracer studies are not trivial to run in the field. Um, so what we try to do is make sure that in the in the laboratory where we use the field materials and we make sure that when we do a treatability test of the using the same material we're gonna inject in the field that we don't see these permeability reductions. Great, thank you, Kurt. Uh, this next question is from the state of Michigan. Um, did your, any of the analyses or experiments that you performed, did you evaluate the impact of field parameters like NOM or TOC um, to see how they impact adsorbent performance. Yeah, so I didn't show any uh, data here in this in this presentation, but we're looking at um, NOM effects, um, and there's also you can have um, you know the ionic strength and the salinity can impact your absorption um, in these systems. Um, we generally use um, either field material, field groundwater, or we create a synthetic groundwater that's based on um, measured parameters in the field. But if you increase your salinity or ionic strength, you generally get increased absorption um, on the most of the activated carbons. Um, the organic matter can compete on some of the systems, and we've uh, seen in some cases it competes for, especially for the shorter chain PFAS, as opposed to the longer chain PFAS is pretty resistant to the uh, natural organic matter, um, but there's definitely can be an effect. And so you need to use your field uh, materials when you do your treatability test. Great, thank you. Um, this next question is from the University of Maryland in Baltimore County. Um, what parameters um, go into consideration for calculating the dose of amendments at the field, field scale? And did you calculate these doses at the last scale? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> our, I guess our key thing initially, we were worried about, we didn't want to change the reduce the permeability. So a lot of our um, dosing was based on doing delivery studies where we changed the ratio or the amount of carbon or resin versus the amount of polymer, and which polymer we used. Um, so we wanted to maximize our attachment of the amendment without significant reductions in permeability. And those, the parameters we looked at for that are um, looking at the particle size, the charge on the particle, 
and the different type of polymers that we could use for the injection. Um, so that's how we approached the selection process. Um, and you you need to be a little careful when you go to like lower permeability materials. So if you have a fine silt um, and make sure that you can inject the material without a lot of back pressure um, or permeability reduction, because that might cause problems in the field. So for every site or every material we try to, um, we, we will tailor the formulation that we use. Um, but one of the key things is to not have um, clogging or permeability reduction um, for these materials. Thank you, Kurt. This next question is from EPA. Have you run desorption experiments following high pore volume leaching with water containing no PFAS? Similarly, have you invested, investigated mobilization of your sorbent following long-term flow? Yeah, these are, these are both excellent questions. <laughs> we, we tend not, I'll start with the second one more first about the mobilization of the particulate amendments. In, in a, just generally, we don't see mobilization or, or re-entrainment of the particles um, if we use the same solution. Um, so we don't change the solution chemistry and particularly the ionic strength. Um, in general, if you increase ionic strength, uh, the particles will attach more strongly or less likely to re-entrain. Um, the main concern is if you lower, you know, if you have a high ionic strength solution or a relatively high ionic strength solution that you inject with or is native, and then it goes lower, um, you could have a re-entrainment of particles. So the only way we've seen it is with um, when we lower the ionic strength substantially, um, we can get some particle release. Um, so that's, uh, so solution chemistry can impact your attachment um, in the system. So that's a, that's a major concern, but in general, solution ionic strength doesn't go down generally, um, but I guess it could in, in some you know, places that are near the ocean. Um, and then in terms of the, if you basically, you, you can imagine we're in the, the first part of the question, we're injecting, a, you know, we have a plume of contaminant going through and at some point, um, that plume is exhausted. I guess, I think that's the question. What happens if we put in uh, clean water or water does not contain PFAS, will we get desorption? And the answer is you will get desorption um, or you can get desorption. A fraction of the um, mass will come back off. Um, some of the mass is sequestered and there's all, obviously a kinetics of desorption. Um, but if you just, if you have like a really high concentrated PFAS solution and then you switch to um, non-PFAS water, uh, you will see some of the material come back off. And so we're, we're actually running experiments on that now. Um, in the field, it, you know, that wouldn't really happen unless you got to where the plume is exhausted um, or the concentrations went way, way down or changed substantially from the initial uh, application. So, but that is a concern um, if you went, you know, if you cleaned up the entire site or the plume passed through. All right, great, Kurt. We have time for one last quick question, but we promise to come back at the end of the webinar to try and uh, get to the other questions. But this is from Jacob. And um, the question is as follows. When doing site investigations for PFAS, Often a network of monitoring wells is installed to determine groundwater con concentrations. Could the selection of material of the monitoring well have an effect on PFAS concentrations if carbon is known to sequester PFAS? So, so this is in particular to using materials like carbon steel in the well versus PVC. <clears throat> any any concern? I um I don't think so. Not that I know of, but I obviously I haven't looked at that. Um, but I don't think it would be a major concern. Great. All right. Well, thank you, Kurt. Um, 
We still have about, we've got a total of 35 questions. We'll get to the rest later, but at this point, we're gonna go ahead and transition to our second presentation, which will be delivered by two speakers. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce them both um, and then turn it on, uh, turn this uh, over to, um, to Ayn to get us uh, started with a second presentation. So two speakers, starting with Mr. Matt Vanderkoy, who is a principal contaminant geoscientist at Geosyntec uh, Consultants in Canada. He is an expert on the development of PFAS conceptual site models, as well as PFAS fate, transport, and remediation. He currently leads uh, PFAS characterization and remediation programs in surface water, sediment, groundwater, air, stormwater, and soils, and is the PI for the project you're going to be hearing about today. He also manages a large PFAS impacted groundwater project, which recently won the National Groundwater Association 2023 Outstanding Groundwater Remediation Project Award. Um, Matt received a bachelor's degree in chemistry from the University of Waterloo and a master's degree in hydrogeology, also from the University of Waterloo. And our second speaker is Dr. Ayn Fahm, who is an assistant professor in civil and environmental engineering at the University of Waterloo, where he leads the Environmental Aquatic Chemistry Research Group. Ayn's research group applies aquatic chemistry and geochemistry principles and employs analytical chemistry tools to investigate contaminant fate, transport, and treatment. His current research focuses on PFAS in groundwater, soil, surface water, wastewater, and biosolid. biosolids. He serves on the editorial board of Critical Reviews in Environmental Science and Technology, and is an ad hoc proposal reviewer for the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Ayn received a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from Hanoi University of Technology and master's and doctoral degrees in civil and environmental engineering from the University of California, Berkeley. Go Bears! Uh, glad to have you, Ayn. Please get us started. Thank you very much, Rula, for the introduction. Uh, as Rula mentioned, uh, our project focused on investigating factors that affect in situ PFAS immobilization by activated carbon. So I'm going to kick us off by introducing the problem statement and the project objectives. Then I'll talk about the approaches that our team is implementing to investigate in situ PFAS adoption. And for the result part of the presentation, I'll share with you what we have learned so far about the factors that control PFAS adoption on colloidal activated carbon. Then I'll pass the microphone to my co-presenter, Matt Vanderkoy. Uh, Matt will talk about the factors that affect colloidal behavior of CAC. Matt will also talk about an experiment investigating PFAS retention and breakthrough in a sand column that contains CAC. Then Matt will talk about some of the modeling activities that our team has conducted. Uh, and finally, Matt uh, will wrap up the presentation with conclusions and a discussion on how the results generated in our project may benefit DOD. So by now, probably most of us are aware that PFAS are emerging soil and groundwater contaminants. And what is unique about PFAS compared to other types of contaminants that we dealt with in the past is that PFAS are extremely resistant to biological and chemical degradation. And as a result, remedial options for PFAS contaminated sites are rather limited at the moment. So today, PFAS contaminated groundwater has been treated mostly by ex situ adsorption, uh, which involves extracting groundwater to the surface and treating the groundwater with adsorbents such as activated carbon or ion exchange resin. But ex situ adsorption is not the focus of our project. Our project focuses on in situ adsorption of PFAS by activated carbon barriers. So illustrated in this diagram is how we envision this in situ technology may work. Uh, in this technology, a slurry of uh, powder activated carbon and colloidal activated carbon is injected into the subsurface to create a stationary barrier. This barrier intercepts the PFAS plume and the absorption of PFAS by AC will stop the migration of PFAS. And so what would uh, come out on the other side of the barrier is the groundwater that is free of PFAS. Now, 
it's important to emphasize that AC barriers remove PFAS by absorption and not destruction. So if PFAS is continuously uh, released from a source zone upstream, the breakthrough of PFAS would take place once the adsorptive sites in the barrier are saturated. And so the key question for this technology is how long will AC barrier last before PFAS show up uh, on the other side of the barrier? And so the overarching goal of our project is to evaluate the potential for in situ AC barriers to arrest the migration of PFAS plumes. And uh, we have three objectives. Uh, the first one is to investigate the factors that affect PFAS absorption on colloidal activated carbon. The second one is to evaluate the transport and binding of CAC in porous media. This evaluation is important uh, to the implementation of this technology in terms of barrier design and in terms of how barriers should be installed in the field. And then the other objective of our project is to assess the long-term performance of AC barriers with respect to PFAS retention and uh, re-release. We investigate PFAS absorption, colloidal activated carbon behavior, and PFAS retention and breakthrough in CAC barriers via bench scale and also field scale experiments. And in parallel with lab and field scale experiments, we are also developing a reactive transport model that aims to predict PFAS retention and breakthrough in AC barriers. And the experimental data generated in the lab and in the field will be used to calibrate and validate the model. So for the presentation today, I'll share with you some of our bench scale absorption results. And as I mentioned earlier, I'll, uh, Matt, uh, uh, Matt will brief, uh, briefly discuss CAC transport and binding, as well as PFAS immobilization in a CAC column. And Matt will also talk about some of the modeling efforts by our team member, uh, Dr. Grant Carey. For the bench scale adsorption trust, uh, our primary focus to date has been investigating the adsorption of PFAS on PlumeStop. And PlumeStop is a commercial CAC product. And the graph on the left here shows uh, the particle size distribution of CAC in the PlumeStop product. And we can see that over 70% of uh, CAC in PlumeStop are less than two micron. And in addition to CAC, uh, plume stuff also contains polymers, which serve as stabilizers that enhance CST stability and keep CST suspended in the solution. And so when plume stuff is injected into the subsurface, uh, the very small particle size of CAC coupled with the polymers would allow CAC particles to spread out and form a, a CAC barrier. The photo in the middle of this slide shows uh, one of the reactors that uh, we use to investigate adsorption on plume stop in the lab. Uh, in each of these reactors, we have solution containing PFAS and bicarbonate, which serves as a background electrolyte. And the solution is black because there's also C is CAC in the reactor. And uh, using this experimental approach, we have learned quite a bit about uh, the adsorption behavior of PFAS on plume stop. So for example, the figure on the right here shows the adsorption kinetics for two short chain PFAS, PFBA and PFBS, and two long chain PFAS, P4 and P4. And you can see that the rate and extent of PFAS adsorption are compound dependent. Uh, specifically in this experiment, we have more PFAS and P4 absorbed than PFBA and PFBS. However, in the case of PFBA and PFBS, adsorption equilibrium was reached within the first three days, whereas the concentration of PFOS and PFOA in the aqueous phase was still declining at the end of this experiment. And the fact that adsorption equilibrium had not been established for PFOS and PFOA even after seven days is quite intriguing because we initially expected that adsorption on colloidal size sorbents would be relatively fast. So we think that what could be happening in this case is that uh, because Bloomstuff CAC are coated with polymers for PFAS to absorb on the surface, the PFAS molecules would need to displace the polymer first. And that process uh, would take some time. And the way we test that hypothesis about the role of polymer is that we investigated the adsorption of PFAS on four CAC materials that do not contain polymers. 
we prepare these four CAC materials by wet milling granular activated carbon and powdered activated carbon. And the graphs on the right here uh, show the rate of adsorption of PFBS, P4, and P4 on these four CAC materials. And the first thing that you'll notice is that uh, CAC materials are not created equally. So for example, this actic CAC material uh, did not absorb PFAS appreciably, and it's a wood-based material. The other feature that I'd like to uh, call your attention to is that adsorption equilibria for all three compounds on all four CACs were established within a couple of days. So this result supports our hypothesis about the polymers in plume stop slowing PFAS and P4 adsorption. Now, the graph on this slide further illustrates the effect of the stabilizing polymers on PFAS adsorption. In this experiment, we investigated the adsorption of five different PFAS on two types of Bloomstop CAC, uh, the polymer-containing Bloomstop and the polymer-free Bloomstop. And the y-axis on this graph is the concentration of PFAS on activated carbon, and on the x-axis is the solution concentration. And you'll notice that the polymer-free CAC adsorbed more PFAS than the polymer-containing CAC. And we interpret this to be a result of competitive absorption between the stabilizing polymer and PFAS. And so what we show here suggests that uh, for as long as the polymers are present, this will have an effect on the degree of PFAS absorption in CAC barriers. And once the polymer is washed away, there'll be more uh, sites on CAC available for PFAS absorption. Now, speaking of competitive absorption at PFAS impacted sites, quite often there could be other contaminants that co-mingle with PFAS uh, in the groundwater. And these co-contaminants may compete with PFAS for absorptive site as well. The graph on this slide show the effect of two co-contaminants on the absorption of P4 on plume stop CAC. The panel on the left shows the adsorption of P4 in the presence of a range of concentrations of benzene. In this case, we use benzene to represent uh, low molecular weight aromatic components in hydrocarbon fuels. And you can see that under our experimental condition, there's no appreciable effect of benzene on P4 adsorption. On the contrary, we saw a significant inhibition of P4 adsorption by diethylene glycol butyl ether, DGBE, also known as butyl carbidol. And this butyl carbidol compound is an important component in many aqueous film forming foam formulations, and therefore butyl carbidol could be present at, uh, in atropf uh, impacted groundwater. So in the plot shown on the right here, uh, we see that adding 10 milligram per liter and then 50 milligram per liter and 100 milligram per liter of butyl carbidol leads to a significant decrease in P4 absorption. And so the take home message from this slide is that the effect of co-contaminants on PFAS absorption depends on the type of contaminants and also their concentration. Now, uh, while co-contaminants could suppress absorption, there are other solution chemistry, uh, chemistry parameters that can increase absorption. Uh, in this graph, uh, uh, you'll notice that the adsorption of P4 uh, progressively increase as the concentration of calcium or sodium chloride increase. And we interpret the effect of sodium chloride to be a result of the salting out effect, whereas the effect of calcium to be a result of some form of a specific interaction between the surface, the calcium, and the PFAS, and that specific interaction enhanced PFAS option. And so the results shown on this slide suggest that we can expect greater PFAS adsorption at sites where groundwater contain high concentration of calcium or at sites where uh, high ionic strength is present, such as sites in coastal areas. So speaking about uh, the effect of ionic strength and calcium on the performance of CAC barriers, I'm going to pass this to Matt, who will talk about uh, the effect of these parameters on colloidal, colloidal carbon stability. Thank you, Ayn. Appreciate it. When characterizing the ability of in-situ CAC barriers to mitigate PFAS plumes in situ, we need to consider how injected CAC is transported in situ, attaches to aquifer solids, and creates a CAC barrier. 
in addition to how you just presented how solution chemistry affects PFAS sorption to CAC. First, I'm going to describe some of our, our experimental work characterizing CAC attachment. Then I'll describe a field trial where we are presently conducting work to evaluate PFAS sorption dynamics in situ at a site-specific location. And then I'm going to link this field effort to observations from the laboratory column experiment and some modeling simulations. Then I'll summarize and conclude our presentation. The first place we'll start is by examining how solution chemistry affects CAC sedimentation. In other words, CAC settling out of solution. And here we're examining plume stop CAC in the presence of polymers. We show two graphs depicting CAC sedimentation, which is occurring here in the laboratory cuvettes where we're measuring absorbance as a proxy for how much CAC is in solution and how much is settling out. The graph on the left are low ionic strength solutions with various constituents. You can see we have calcium, potassium, magnesium, and sodium. On the right, we have higher ionic strength. We're now at 0.2 equivalents per liter rather than the 0.025 equivalents per liter. What we observe in the low ionic strength graph on the left is that the CAC sedimentation is relatively similar for each solution chemistry examined. The absorbance on the y-axis decreases to about half the initial value after about 4,500 minutes, or about three days. In contrast, on the high ionic strength graph, we do see a similar trend for most of our solutions, with the exception of the cuvette with calcium at 0.2 equivalents per liter. Here we see a precipitous drop in absorbance. We interpret this to reflect calcium bridging between CAC particulates, leading to greater net size of these particulates, and then greater sedimentation. For some context, the calcium content at about 0.2 equivalents per liter is approximately equal to 4,000 milligrams per liter or four grams per liter. The relevant finding for us here is that we can use the presence of calcium to control CAC aggregation. And therefore we can potentially use CA calcium in situ to control CAC migration. And indeed CAC injection contractors have communicated to us that they'll use calcium concentrations up to 10,000 milligrams per liter to help park, i.e. attach CAC to aquifer solids by either injecting calcium chloride solution with the CAC they're injecting or into downgrading wells. This concept of parking leads us to examine how CAC particulates attach to aquifer solids. Oh, I went one too far. Here I show three graphs to illustrate certain CAC attachment concepts. In our left leftmost graph, we have three curves depicting CAC effluent from a sand column, where calcium concentrations are being increased from 0.0125 to 0.1 molar. With each successive increase in calcium concentration, the eluded CAC concentration from the sand column, which is plotted on the y-axis, decreases. These decreasing curves with increasing calcium concentration we use to interpret to be greater CAC attachment as more calcium bridging occurs between CAC particulates leading to greater attachment. In the next two graphs, we examine how increasing ionic strength that changes these attachment dynamics. For both graphs, the solution chemistry contains sodium and calcium cations. In the middle graph, we have a 0.4 molar solution. And here we see evidence of the ripening attachment mechanism uh, described in colloid filtration theory. Here, colloids, in this case, CAC particulates, attach to already attached CAC particulates, leading to lower and lower eluted CAC concentrations. Then in the rightmost graph, the proportions of calcium to sodium are kept constant to each other, but the concentrations are increased twofold. And now we see that much less CAC is eluding. You'll notice that our y-axis is a much smaller scale by an order of magnitude. What we interpret here is evidence of the straining mechanism, again described in colloid filtration theory. This suggests that CAC bridging leads to larger particle sizes and potentially additional retention at poor throats. I think the overall conclusion we want to provide to you is that these experiments uh, show that when we inject CAC into field sites, attachment to aquifers might depend on solution chemistry and aquifer properties. 
In other words, if we want to be specific about modeling the uh, emplacement of our CAC barriers, site-specific circumstances may affect the attachment of CAC. And keeping with the theme of site-specific, I wanna describe some work we're doing at a field program. Now, multiple research groups are evaluating the sorption of PFAS to CAC under different soil and geochemical conditions. Additionally, more CAC barriers are installed each year to control PFAS migration. Together, these data sets are building a body of knowledge to help us test qualitative predictions about the effective lifespans and performances of CAC barriers for PFAS control. I'm going to share some brief details of our site-specific fieldwork program. We are collaborating with another research team, the ESTCP project ER205182, led by Dr. Paul Hatzinger of Aptim Federal Services. Dr. Hatzinger's team and ours have instrumented a high resolution network of monitoring wells at a field site where we will be monitoring the performance of a CAC barrier over the next couple of years. We hope the results from this field investigation will significantly enhance our understanding of the factors that affect PFAS retention and breakthrough in CAC barriers, which will help improve CAC barrier design. Specifically in our study, we are seeking to both quantitatively estimate and observe the chromatographic separation of various PFAS species within the CAC barrier. We hypothesize we will be able to observe the more mobile, that's the less well-sorbing shorter chain PFAS, like PFBS or PFBA, migrating further through the barrier before larger PFAS species. We've chosen this objective since the time span to observe complete PFAS breakthrough through the CAC barrier may be long. Our hope is that we will be able to observe and quantitatively predict this internal migration, this internal chromatic, chromatography of shorter chain PFAS, and use this as a metric by which we can test our ability to model the dynamics and lifespans of CAC barriers. On this point, our research team has also conducted some sand calm experiments to help us evaluate similar phenomena we may see in the field trial. Specifically here, I'm showing you some sand column work our research teams have done, where first we've added colloidal activated carbon to the sand column. Then we began an injection of perfluorobutane sulfonic acid, PFBS, a four carbon relatively mobile PFAS species. After approximately 250 pore volumes, we added perfluorohexane sulfonic acid, PFHXS. At six carbons, it is relatively less mobile and more strongly sorbent. The results show that over time when we're just injecting PFBS, we see that PFBS concentrations increase as a CAC sand column becomes more and more saturated with PFBS. Then we introduce PFHXS to the influent. And here we see at that point, the PFBS concentrations increase to 1.3 to 1.4 times their inlet concentrations. This is a concentration overshoot that we are interpreting to be the result of PFBS being competitively displaced from CAC by PFHXS. We anticipate we might observe similar dynamics occurring in our field trial. Taking this a bit further, we're going to do modeling now where members of our research team, specifically Grant Carey, have also used modeling methods to evaluate how in situ PFAS plumes might evolve down gradient of CAC barriers. Here, the first modeling-based simulation I'm showing is a PFAS plume at an AFFF site where the fate of the plume was modeled over 50 years. There's six panels here showing the evolution of PFOA over time. The top left panel shows the initial idealized PFOA plume conditions with CAC barriers, that's barrier one and barrier two, placed at the middle and at the end of the plume. The panels then show the plume evolving over five, 10, then 20, and 30, and 50 years. The model assumes the aquifer contains 0.25% FOC with linear reversible sorption of PFAS. What this means, having this FOC content, is that there will be matrix storage of PFAS and there will be re-release of PFAS from these aquifer solids. And we see this as the panels evolve over time, the plume down gradient of the middle barrier slowly diminishes. 
but is still present after 50 years. And we interpret that this is the plume being resupplied in our modeling results by the release of soared PFOA from aquifer solids. And we come to this conclusion because when we examine the down gradient portion, uh, down gradient of that last barrier, barrier two, the simulation indicates no PFOA is present. So what we see is PFOA is not present here initially down gradient, nor did it break through, suggesting that the continuation of the PFOA in the uh, post barrier one is due to resupply from aquifer solids. So the implication from the simulation has, has some lessons we might you know, draw from this. The first is that CAC barriers may be most effectively used on expanding and migrating plumes on plumes at property boundaries or directly upgrading of receptors. For example, if a plume might be discharging to a surface water body. Conversely, the simulation also indicates that if you were to only remediate the source area, the PFAS plume may be still present in groundwater for decades afterwards, once that downgrading source might have been removed or immobilized. If you wanna learn more, this simulation and the description of its implications is described in an open source paper that's listed as an additional resource in the resource sections of this presentation. I'm gonna take you to one more simulation where what we're looking at is some work our team did where we worked closely with Dr. Tony Danko at the Navy to evaluate how CAC performance may be affected at coastal sites that have increased ionic strength. Here we observed that the increased ionic strength in this tidal environment where we have higher ionic strength positively influences PFAS sorption to CAC. We have greater sorption for the amount of CAC we put in. But also we had increased sorption of PFAS to natural organic matter in the aquifer downgrading of the barrier. This means that there's a larger mass of PFAS sorbed to the soil's downgrading of the barrier which will result over time in a slower decline of PFAS concentrations as there's a continual release of PFAS from these soils. These observations echo observations made earlier by Dr. Pham of how solution chemistry affects PFAS sorption. And this now takes us to the conclusions of our presentation. Our research program indicates that solution chemistry is a governing factor for both CAC attachment and PFAS sorption. Specifically, the presence of calcium ions enhances PFAS sorption and CAC attachment. Meanwhile, PFAS sorption can be diminished by the presence of co-contaminants, such as, such as DGBE, i.e. butyl carbidol. While competitive sorption of PFAS species that's, can lead to concentration overshooting of the more mobile, less strongly sorbed PFAS. Our modeling assessments indicate that CAC barriers potentially have their highest value at the downgrading ends of plume or property boundaries or directly upgrading of receptors. And our future research will focus on developing and testing our model predictions of CAC barrier performance. The benefits of this research program are intended to support the potential beneficial application of CAC barriers. CAC barriers have the ability and promise to mitigate PFAS plume migration in situ. Our research program is developing data and tools to support quantitative predictions of CAC barrier performance and longevity. We want to acknowledge and thank Dr. Neil Thompson, Brent Sleep, and Grant Carey, and the invaluable and in indispensable graduate students working on this project, all of whom are responsible for much of the work and concepts presented today. Should you wish to learn more about the concepts presented here, you can read these two papers published by our team members on topics presented here. With that, I thank you for our time, your time and here are our contact information. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Matt and Ann. Uh, we did receive a bunch of questions, so let us start with some of these. The first one I um, think is for uh, Ann. Uh, uh, you talked about competitive sorption between PFAS and co-contaminants, um, but you mentioned that benzene did not affect uh, PFOA adsorption. Did benzene adsorb on the CAC? And if yes, why did benzene not 
affect, affect default absorption? Oh, thanks for that excellent question. So we did see that benzene was completely removed in our experimental system, meaning that we do have benzene absorbing on the CAC, but we didn't see, like I mentioned in the presentation, we didn't see a, uh, an appreciable effect of benzene on P4 absorption. And one of the hypotheses that we have at the moment is that those two types of compounds are absorbing on different adsorptive sites. Uh, benzene is relatively small and it's not charged, so it's a neutrally charged compound. Uh, and so benzene may um, absorb to a different type of site in the micropoles, as an example, whereas before uh, a relatively larger molecule with a charge, a negative charge uh, on the head group uh, may absorb to a different site. So. Uh, we think that there is no direct competition for absorptive sites between the two types of compound, and that's why we are not seeing benzene affecting P4 adsorption. Great, thank you so much. And a follow-up question for you. What was the reason for the low PFAS on the wood-based activated carbon? Uh, so that's another very uh, interesting question. So the wood-based activated carbon has a point of zero charge of five, meaning that under our experimental condition, the surface of that specific activated carbon is negative. Whereas for the other types of activated carbon, that point of zero charge is around 10, 12. And so the surface of those materials are positively charged. So because of the wood base surface, wood base CAC surface is, is negatively charged. There's a repulsion between the surface and the negative charge on P4 and PFPS and PFPA and PFOS molecules. And we think that that repulsion uh, inhibits absorption of PFAS on that specific type of wood base CAC. Great. Oh, thank you. This next question is from an anonymous attendee. Uh, did you consider precursors like fluorotelomer sulfonates? And does sorption prevent in any way the transformation of precursors to terminal end products? Uh, on if you want to start, and then perhaps we could um, pass it on to Matt to see if he'd like to add any comments. Yeah. So that is a very good question to you. We have looked at one precursor, actually two precursors in our batch scale experiment. Uh, and we did see, so the, the one of the two compounds that we investigated is 6,2-FTS, uh, the ones that has two carbon that is hydrogenated and not fluorinated. And we did see 6,2-FTS absorb it on colloidal activated carbon, and there's a clear trend between uh, PFOS, which also has uh, eight carbon, but eight fully fluorinated carbon, 6,2-FTS, uh, and PFHXS, which is another uh, fully fluorinated carbon, but only fully fluorinated PFAS, but only has six carbon. And there's a trend and there's uh, uh, absorption that can be explained by the compounds hydrophobicity. And uh, so I think, so from our data, we think that absorption of the precursors will very much be controlled by the, the structure, similar to how the compounds that we have studied, um, the structure of the compounds that we have studied to control absorption. In terms of biotransformation, we haven't investigated uh, the, if, if the absorbent compound can be biotransformed. But, but that's a very good question. And uh, that's something that we'll look into in the future. Great. Uh, this next question is from EPA and we got similar, a similar question to Kurt that we didn't get to. And it has to do with the long-term stability of these amendments in the subsurface um, as it relates to potential biodegradation. How stable are these uh, amendments? Um, do they biodegrade at all over time? 
So I'm going to... If you want to go ahead and okay. start, Ayn, and, and then yeah. I'd like Kurt yeah. to weigh in. Okay, so the uh, if I understand the question correctly, this is related to the stability of the amendment and not the PFAS. Correct. Okay, so activated carbon is stable as a material. Activated carbon doesn't biodegrade. Now, there was an early question uh, after uh, Dr. Pennell's presentation that is related to biofouling or fouling in general. I think any amendment that is injected in situ will have some sort of fouling over time because the material surface will change as we have absorption happening. Uh, and so the question is to what extent will that change happen and how that will change the absorption and retention of PFAS in a C in, in an, a barrier is still a question that should be uh, investigated. Great, thank you. And, and Kurt, um, for your ion exchange resins that you're looking at, how stable are they and resistant to uh, biological breakdown over time? We haven't specifically looked at um, their potential for breakdown. I imagine they're relatively stable. Um, but as was mentioned by on, you know, there is the potential for fouling or for changes over time. Um, so we have done some shutting experiments where we stop the flow and let them sit for a while. Um, but we haven't done experiments where we specifically looked at like a bioactive column and what effect you know that would have on the on the performance. But definitely there that's an area that needs to be studied. Great. Thank you both. And this next question is for Matt. Matt, you talked about um, the impact of calcium on the on the uh, activated carbon in terms of destabilizing it. How far, given that, how far will the activated carbon travel if groundwater contains high calcium concentration? What I can share with you, Rula, is a perspective on if you do have enough calcium to immobilize the CAC, like really like uh, injection contractors often use, is that you don't see much migration of CAC. It seems to be pretty effective. Uh, to put kind of an observational point on this, when we've spoken with Regenesis and they describe injecting CAC barriers uh, with calcium chloride, when they look at their down gradient monitoring wells, they're not seeing this CAC present in these wells when they're being uh, injected with calcium. So we're not expecting a, a great degree of movement. And, and I want to add just a little bit more to that. You know, from the observations that we've, you know, we're aware of today, that attachment seems to be fairly permanent. So over time, if you're in a more, you know, uh, non-saline condition, that injected calcium is going to flush from the system. But we see that CAC after attachment tends to remain attached. Great. Um, all right, and another question for you. Uh, based on the work that you've done, um, you've mentioned site-specific conditions when trying to model in situ um, the um, uh, potential uh, placement of, of these barriers. But, but in general, based on your work, which activated carbon have you found to be better for PFAS absorption, coal-based or shell-based? I know that often both can be used, and I think Ayn's going to be actually the best person to answer that question. So Ayn, I want to give it to you. It's actually a very good question. And uh, I think that both materials can be used for in situ absorption. So there are two parts to the uh, performance of a CAC barrier. Uh, number one, absorption capacity, and number two, CAC mobility. And if even if uh, this, the desorption of PFAS on one type of CAC is better than on another type of CAC. I don't think that is the controlling factor uh, 
for the design of CAC battery because if the difference is not much, we can inject more or less of one product. And that will address the issue of having enough absorptive site for PFAS immobilization. So I don't think that it's coal-based or coconut shell-based CAC that will um, that is um, that um, will be the factor that uh, affect the decision. Uh, it's more about CAC mobility and how we can in create a barrier that is uh, that have enough absorptive sites for absorbing of PFAS under different water chemistry or different or under specific uh, site specific condition. Great. Um, well, thank you both. Uh, I'd like to move to some more general questions about the applicability of such an approach at PFAS impacted sites. So I'll ask the three of you to please weigh in. Uh, given your work, what are the most optimal contamination scenarios for in-situ adsorptive technologies? Uh, and we'll start with you, Kurt. All right. Thanks, Rola. Um, <clears throat> so the I think one of the key things is is the material deliverable without permeability reduction. Um, and so at sites that have relatively high permeability media, uh, like a sandy aquifer material, I think it, you know, the ability to inject it without back pressure, uh, without clogging are very favorable. However, if you go to sites where there, you might be working in a fine silt or, or a, a lower permeability media, you, I think you need to be very careful um, with injection. And this really applies to any, any particulate amendment. Um, if you inject in that type of a site, it, you may run into problems. So one of the key things is the, the permeability of the, of the native material. Um, that's one of the, I think, the key issues. Uh, there are, you know, obviously issues with solution chemistry, co-contaminants. Um, I think a lot of those things can be dealt with if you do proper studies in advance. Um, and so you have to keep those in mind, but I don't think they're showstoppers in a way. So those are just two uh, thoughts I have on them. Thank you, Kurt. Matt, any, anything you, yeah. you'd like to share that Kurt hasn't covered? I think I just reemphasize that upgrading of receptors is likely the the best location if I'm you know doing a remedy evaluation when is an injectable CAC barrier going to come up closer to the top of my list it's when I need to get reduction soon and I uh, have an immediately down gradient receptor that's where I'll start to consider it more and more often Thank you. And Ayn, any closing thoughts? I think Matt has covered everything and Kurt has covered everything that I wanted to cover as well. So. Wonderful. Well, I'd like to thank all three of you for a great webinar. Um, our next webinar is on Thursday, March 7, in two weeks. Uh, it will focus on DOD-funded research efforts to minimize response time to system leaks uh, and maximum system data to predict water use at DOD installations. We'd encourage you to visit the Startup and ESCCP webinar webpage to register for this and other webinars through the end of 2024. And to echo what Cara said, um, there is uh, an audio and a copy of the presentation of today's session. Both will be archived on our webinar webpage in case you'd like to refer to them in the future. And if you could please take a moment to um, complete the survey that will pop up on your screen, we would be very grateful. This concludes today's webcast. Thank you so much for joining us.